Chapter 21 On July 29th, Lieutenant Joji Yamashita returned to Lei from his Buna patrol with news that electrified the entire base. His planes had been attacked for the first time by American naval aircraft. He reported to Commander Nakajima and Captain Saito that his nine zeros had encountered a mixed force of American SBD Dauntless dive bombers and F-4F Wildcat fighters, led to the Buna area by P-39 Pathfinders, which, he estimated, had come from Rabi. The Navy warplanes were the first to appear in our theater. The news that an American aircraft carrier had moved into New Guinea waters was ominous, and our staff officers appeared upset. If the Americans had carriers to spare for operations against our forces at Ley, Buna and Rabul, then there appeared to be some truth in their claims of victory at Midway and their denials of major losses during the Coral Sea battle. If what Tokyo had claimed was true, that our fleet had destroyed the enemy carriers encountered in the Coral Sea and off Midway, how could there be a carrier in our vicinity? Something was wrong, and for the first time we felt doubts regarding the authenticity of Tokyo's repeated claims of victory. The majority of fighter pilots at Ley, however, greeted the news in an entirely different fashion. Late into the night we threw questions at Yamashita's pilots. How many Navy planes were there? Were the Wildcats better than the P-39s and the P-40s? How good were the American Navy pilots? Their answers were encouraging, for Yamashita's squadron put in claims for three dive bombers, five fighters, and one P-39 definitely shot down, without the loss of a single zero. This made unimportant what might have happened at Midway, or at the Coral Sea, or anywhere else. All we cared about was that for four successive months we had whipped the enemy's fighters and bombers time and time again, and that the appearance of his navy planes meant that much greater an opportunity for gaining even more victories. But for the next three days, the new enemy planes failed to appear over Buna. On the 30th, nine B-17s attacked the beachhead area with considerable success, and our nine fighters managed to shoot down only one bomber of the enemy formation. I received credit for the victory when I caught the fourth fortress over Cape Nelson and managed to concentrate my fire into its nose. Apparently the pilot and co-pilot were killed, for the big airplane plunged into the ocean out of control. It was one of my hardest air battles, for I returned to lay with several inches of skin scraped off my right arm from the bomber's guns. I had missed death by no more than the thickness of a hair and my mechanics worked all night to patch up the dozens of bullet holes in the fuselage and wings. On August 2nd, all thought of Navy planes fled from our minds. Before the day was over, we had behind us a tremendous occasion to remember. The dream of all Japanese fighter pilots come true. We were circling over Buna at 12,000 feet when we sighted five tiny specks against the clouds several miles away from the beachhead. They were at our height, and they appeared to be fortresses. I flew alongside Sasai's plane and indicated the oncoming bombers. He nodded, and we both pointed out the B-17s to the other pilots. We kept our formation, circling slowly, until the four engines of each bomber became clearly visible. Sasai signaled us to follow him. He raised his right hand, rocked his wings to give the order to break up our V formations into a single column for a head-on attack. Our fuel tanks tumbled through the air. Now was our chance to put to the acid test the theories we had worked out in our billets at night. In a few moments, we would know whether or not the fortresses were vulnerable to the head-on attack. The situation was perfect. Nine Zero fighters against five of the great B-17s, and among that nine, we had the leading aces of all Japan. Sasai led the attack. Ota dropped 500 yards behind his plane, followed by Endo. I slipped into fourth position, also at a 500-yard distance, and my wingmen, Yonakawa and Hattori, followed me as numbers five and six in the column. Nishizawa took seventh place, then Takatsuka, and finally, Nap 3C Yoshio Sueyoshi in the rear slot. Nine zeros, spread out over a distance of 4,000 yards, and carrying the best pilots Japan had produced. The fortresses tightened their formation as we closed in, Sasai's fighter dropped below the lead bomber, then climbed at a shallow angle, rolling slowly as he aimed at the lower nose section of the plane. The next second he flashed up and over as he completed his firing run. 
Smoke trailed from all five bombers, but it was the smoke of their 50 caliber guns. The enemy formation continued on. Then Otter made his bid, following exactly the same maneuver as Sasai. I watched the flashes of his tracers as they bit into the lead bomber. Then Otter's wing lifted up as he began his breakaway turn. The next instant, a violent explosion hid every plane from view. A flash of intense light appeared in the sky, followed by a tremendous smoke cloud. Even from a half-mile distance, the shockwave jolted my own fighter. The B-17 was no longer in the sky. It had disappeared, shattered into small pieces of wreckage when its M1 bomb load went off under the impact of Ota's cannon shells. It was the most spectacular air kill I had ever seen, and I cheered loudly as Otter Zero rocketed upward through the smoke. By now Endo was in his firing run, diving and climbing upward at a shallow angle. The Zero rolled slowly as it raced against the bombers, both cannon and machine guns spitting out flame as he closed in. His tracers went wild, and Endo went for altitude as the bomber guns bracketed him in a heavy crossfire. My turn now. I pulled back gently on the stick, and the third fortress in the formation expanded slowly in my rangefinder. Closer and closer he came, and I squeezed the trigger. Nothing happened. The bomber seemed to fill the entire sky before me before I found out what was wrong. Stupid. I had failed to release the safety lock on the trigger, an error not even the greenest pilot would make. It was almost my undoing and I rolled violently to clear the B-17 at a distance of only 20 yards. Their gunners had me in a crossfire. The Zero lurched as bullets slammed into the fuselage, and I felt the shock of the heavy slugs ripping through metal. I was frantic now, and with my fighter's belly up, I held the stick over hard to the left, rolling wildly. I was through, but not without damage. I raged at my own stupidity, but it was too late. I had wasted a perfect firing pass. I dropped below the enemy formation and gunned the engine to overboost to race ahead of the bombers for another run. Nishizawa was already climbing against his B-17. He went in beautifully, his fighter arcing up slowly in its gradual climb, rolling steadily as the distance narrowed between his fighter and the enemy plane. His attack was perfect as he kept pouring cannon shells into the wing fuel tanks. Abruptly, a splash of flame burst through the wing, spread rapidly, and in a few seconds, the fortress seemed to turn into a gigantic flamethrower. Brilliant fire streamed into the wind from the wing and along the fuselage. The plane skidded wildly, and its nose dropped. Then it was gone. Another mighty explosion flipped Nishizawa's fighter over on its back like a toy and rocked my own Zero sharply. The other bombers reeled under the shockwave even as the remaining fighters screamed by on their firing passes. Now Sasai went in again raking a third bomber from nose to tail. He started firing from a distance of almost 150 yards, and his shells slowly moved back along the fuselage. Pieces of metal erupted from the plane and flipped away in the slipstream. The airplane rolled wildly to the right, out of control. I saw flames within the fuselage, licking out of the cockpit and the second gun turret. The B-17 dropped in a long, sweeping turn, rolling and skidding as it descended the sure sign of a dead pilot and co-pilot. The flames increased and, for the third time in two minutes, another roaring explosion marked the finish of the third B-17. I could hardly believe my eyes. These were the planes which had been driving our fighter pilots frantic wherever they appeared. And now, one, two, three. Three blasting detonations and as many fortresses, just so many small pieces of charred wreckage falling from the sky. The two surviving bombers split up as I came in for my second pass, and I found only empty space in my rangefinder. I went up and over in a high loop, coming out to see the two B-17s racing away in different directions. One headed for the mountains, and the other turned for the open sea. I went after the plane, racing for the water. The B-17 rolled and turned continuously, as I tried for a long burst at the cockpit or fuel tanks. For some strange reason the bombardier failed to jettison his lethal load, and the plane fled under the weight penalty of all its bombs. I dove to gain speed, and came up beneath the bomber, closing in toward the left wing. The B-17 grew larger and larger in my sight, and I opened up. 
watching the shells exploding along the left wing by the fuselage and chewing up the metal skin as they moved toward the bomb bay. The world was blotted out in the next instant. A bolt of light, searing and intense, filled the sky, blinding me. A great fist gripped the zero and flipped it wildly through the air. My ears rang, and I tasted blood trickling down from my nose. The fourth fortress was gone. Everyone had been destroyed by its own bombs. Now only one remained. The bomber fled for the mountains, eight zeros clawing at the great plain like hunting dogs after a massive wild boar. They were hard-pressed to keep up with the B-17, which evidently had jettisoned its bombs and had gained speed. The B-17's course, cutting across my nose, gave me a chance to intercept the airplane before it reached land. My decision was fortunate, indeed. No sooner had I turned and pushed the throttle all the way forward than I sighted three Aracobras rushing down from the east, skimming over the water, obviously answering the distress calls of the fortresses. They closed in on the eight pursuing Zeros, which had no warning of their approach. It was a unique situation. The three P-39s began climbing after eight unsuspecting Zero fighters, and I came around in a wide, sweeping turn on the three unsuspecting enemy planes. The first P-39 moved into firing position against the last Zero when I hit him in a shallow dive. The enemy pilot never knew what happened. Bullets and cannon shells smashed into his fuselage at the wing roots and the airplane disintegrated, one wing flipping wildly through the air. My gun reports carried to the other Zeros, and at once two fighters clawed around in a tight spiral and fell upon the other two P-39s. It was over in seconds. I recognized the planes of our two peerless aces, Nishizawa and Ota. Each pilot fired but one heavy burst, and the Aracobras fell in flames. The three enemy pilots had attacked three times their number in Zero fighters. Regrettably, their skill failed to match their courage. But there was still unfinished business in the air, the lone surviving fortress, which now turned from the land and headed back for the sea. Its speed was visibly reduced, and with its crippled engines, it was only a matter of time before we cut the bomber out of the air. I had barely come out of a long climb after pulling out of my dive against the Aero Cobra when the B-17 moved before my nose. It happened too suddenly to enable me to aim properly, but I snapped out a heavy burst. The shells went wild, and I rolled up and turned to come back for another attack. The crippled fortress was still full of fight. I was climbing past the bomber, watching the tracers arcing through the air after me, when suddenly the Zero shuddered violently. The sounds of hammers beating against metal startled me, and something shook me wildly in the cockpit. My right hand went numb. The Zero skidded crazily, its belly up, and flipped downward out of control. I searched the instruments with fear, but the engine kept up its powerful drone. No flame or smoke. Relief swept over me, for I was prepared to go over the side if necessary. A burning Zero doesn't stay in one piece for very long. I was less than 1,000 feet over the water when I brought the fighter out of its careening plunge. The plane had been hit badly, but its vital parts had not been damaged. Back in normal flying position, I looked at my right hand. A piece of metal was sticking through the glove where it had penetrated the palm. Good fortune was certainly with me today. The jagged piece of metal had been ripped loose by a passing bullet, but without enough energy to cause any serious injury. The fortress lost altitude steadily, trailing a long streamer of white smoke. The Zeros kept at the bomber in their long column, each one snapping out a burst as the pilot dove against the crippled bomber. One fighter broke away from the pack harassing the B-17. It went into a wide, lazy turn and began a gradual descent across the Island coastline. A thin white film trailered in the air behind it. The planer did not seem to be seriously damaged. Its wings were level, but it lost altitude and speed steadily. I turned and glanced at the bomber, which now plunged toward the sea, obviously out of control. By the time I looked again for the lone zero, the airplane was gone. A wild ovation greeted us at Ley as we told the mechanics of our destruction of five flying fortresses. The men leaped and shouted in glee as they heard the details. Five fortresses and three Aracobras. An excellent day. Nishizawa was the seventh pilot to land. 
he climbed out of his cockpit and ignored the hilarious cheers of his ground crew. He asked one question. Where's Sueyoshi? Silence fell on the crowd. Where is my wingman? Nishizawa demanded. Takatsuka climbed from his fighter and walked silently up to Nishizawa. Hasn't Salamawa radioed in? Nishizawa cried. What's the matter with all of you? Hasn't there been any word? Nishizawa went wild. There had been no news from Salamawa, and no one had seen Sueyoshi's fighter after it dropped toward the coast. Refuel my plane and load my guns, Nishizawa ordered. We tried to dissuade him from going out on what seemed to be a hopeless search, but Nishizawa would not be dissuaded. Two hours later he returned, misery written on his face. Sueyoshi, one of the most popular young flyers at Lei, was never found. The day's victory turned bitter in our mouths. Chapter 22 On August 3rd, Rabol called back most of the Zero fighters assigned to Lei. We welcomed the transfer, for it promised relief from the daily patrols over Buna and an escape from the nightly bombings. We left behind us at Lei our personal belongings, fully believing we would soon return. We were wrong. Our first four days at Rabal, we flew reconnaissance and fighter sweep flights to Rabi, which rapidly had been built up into a major enemy fighter nest comparable to Moresby. On August 8th, after receiving our patrol orders from the command post, we started walking across the airfield to our fighters. Most of the 18 pilots were in their cockpits when orderlies ran after us shouting that the flight had been cancelled. We were to report back at once to the command post. The CP was in a wild turmoil. Orderlies and messengers ran to and fro, and the officers who passed us wore worried expressions on their faces. Commander Nakajima, who was to lead today's mission, came out of the Admiral's room, obviously angry, and shouted to us, Today's mission has been called off. We're going somewhere else. He looked around the room. Where the hell is that orderly? You! Pointing to a startled messenger. Get me a chart, quick! He spread the map on a large desk and began plotting a course with a compass. He paid no attention to any of the pilots as he pored over the map. I asked Lieutenant Sasai if he knew what had happened. Sasai questioned Nakajima, received a curt explanation, and rushed into the Admiral's room without speaking to any of us. Several minutes later, he returned and signaled the pilots to gather about him. His words were like a bombshell. At 0520 hours this morning, a powerful enemy amphibious force began an invasion at Lunga, on the southern end of Guadalcanal Island. Our first reports indicate that the Americans are throwing a tremendous amount of men and equipment onto the island. They also have struck in simultaneous attacks at Tulagi on Florida Island. Our entire flying boat flotilla has been destroyed. As soon as the commander has worked out our new routes, we will take off at once for Guadalcanal to attack the enemy forces on the beaches. Orderlies passed out charts of the islands to each pilot. We studied the maps, searching for the unfamiliar island, which had so suddenly become important. The men murmured among themselves. Where is that damned island anyway? cried one exasperated pilot. Who ever heard of such a crazy place? We checked the distance from Rabaul to Guadalcanal. There were low whistles of disbelief. 560 miles. We would have to fly that distance to the enemy beachhead, engage his fighters, and then fly the same mileage back to Rabaul. The distance was unheard of. It meant a round-trip flight of more than 100 miles, without allowance for combat or storms, which would consume fuel in prodigious quantities. That was enough to stop all speculation. We waited silently for the commander to lift his head and give us our new orders. In the meantime, one orderly after the other rushed into the admiral's office with fresh reports from the battlefront. We heard one messenger tell Nakajima that all contact had been lost with Tulagi, that the garrison had died to the last man. Sasai turned pale at the news. I had to ask him several times if anything was wrong. Finally, staring straight ahead, he spoke quietly. My brother-in-law was assigned to Tulagi. There was no denying the certainty of his words. He referred to his sister's husband in the past tense. If Tulagi was now occupied by the enemy, then his brother-in-law, Lieutenant Commander Yoshio Tashiro, 
a flying boat commander, could no longer be among the living. He would fight to the last. His death was confirmed later. Nakajima called for order. You are going to fly the longest fighter operation in history, he warned Use. Don't take any unnecessary chances today. Stick to your orders and, above all, don't fly recklessly and waste your fuel. Any pilot who runs short of fuel on the return from Guadalcanal is to make a forced landing at Buca Island. Our troops there have been instructed to be on the lookout for our planes. Now, to fly to Guadalcanal and return to Buca means covering roughly the same distance as we flew from Tainan to Clark Field in the Philippines and return. I am positive that we can fly that distance without trouble. Returning to Rabaul is another matter. You should be able to make it, but there may be trouble. So I repeat my warning. Don't waste fuel. Commander Nakajima told me in Tokyo after the war that the Admiral wished him to take to Guadalcanal on August 7th. Every Zero fighter at Rabaul, which could fly. Nakajima protested and offered instead to take the 12 best pilots in his wing because he expected to lose at least half of his men during a mission of such extreme range. A bitter argument raged between the two men until they reached a compromise on the figure of 18 fighter planes, with the understanding that the stragglers who landed on Buka were to be picked up later. As soon as we had our orders, the pilots broke up into trios. I told Yonikawa and Hatori, my two wingmen, you'll meet the American Navy flyers for the first time today. They are going to have us at a distinct advantage because of the distance we have to fly. I want you both to exercise the greatest caution in every move you make. Above all, never break away from me. No matter what happens, no matter what goes on around us, stick as close to my plane as you can. Remember that, don't break away. We ran out to our planes and waited for the runways to be cleared. Twenty-seven Betty bombers thundered down the airstrip before us. Commander Nakajima waved his hand over his cockpit. By 8.30 a.m., all the fighters were airborne. The maintenance crews and the pilots who were not flying that day lined both sides of the runway, waving their caps and shouting good luck to us. The weather was perfect, especially for Rabaul. Even the volcano was quiet, its eruptions had ended in June, and only a thin streamer of smoke drifted to the west. We took up our escort positions behind the bombers. I was surprised to see that the Bettys carried bombs instead of torpedoes, the usual armament for attacking shipping. The bombs disturbed me. I knew the problems of hitting moving targets on the sea from high altitude. Even the B-17s, despite their vaunted accuracy, wasted most of their bombs when attacking the shipping off Buna. We gained height slowly, then flew to the east at 13,000 feet for Buka Island. About 60 miles south of Rabaul, I noticed a particularly beautiful island on the water. Brilliantly green and in the shape of a horseshoe, the atoll was listed on the map as Green Island. I had no idea that the eye-catching qualities of the colourful atoll would later prove the key to saving my life. Over Buka, the formations turned and flew south along Bougainville's west coast. The sun beat down warmly through the canopy. The heat made me thirsty, and, since we still had some time before reaching the enemy area, I took out a bottle of soda from my lunchbox. Without thinking, I opened the bottle. I had forgotten the altitude. No sooner had I made a slit in the cork than the soda water geysered violently, the pressure escaping in the rarefied air. In seconds, the sticky soda water was over everything in front of me. Fortunately, the strong cockpit draft dried it almost immediately, but the sugar in the soda water dried on my glasses, and I was unable to see. Disgusted with my own stupidity, I rubbed the goggles. I could see dimly. For the next forty minutes, I struggled to clean not only my goggles, but the windscreen and the controls as well. I had never felt more ridiculous. My fighter wandered all over the formation as I scrubbed with increasing irritation. By the time I could see clearly in all directions, we were already over Vela La Vela, about midway between Rabul and Guadalcanal. Over New Georgia, we went for higher altitude and crossed Russell at 20,000 feet. Fifty miles ahead of us, Guadalcanal loomed out of the water. Even at this distance, I saw flashes of yellow flame against the blue sky over the disputed island. Apparently, 
battles were already underway between Zero fighters from bases other than Rabaul and the defending enemy planes. I looked down at Guadalcanal's northern coastline. In the channel between Guadalcanal and Florida, hundreds of white lines, the wakes of enemy ships, crisscrossed the water. Everywhere I looked, there were ships. I had never seen so many warships and transports at one time. This was my first look at an American amphibious operation. It was almost unbelievable. I saw at least 70 ships pushing toward the beaches, a dozen destroyers cutting white swaths through the water around them, and there were other ships on the horizon, too far distant to make out in detail or to count. Meanwhile, the bombers swung slowly for their runs. Dead ahead of them, small clouds drifted at 13,000 feet. To our right and above was the sun, its blinding glare blotting everything from view. I was uncomfortable. We would be unable to see any fighters dropping from that angle. My fear was soon realized. Without warning, six fighter planes emerged from that glare, almost as if they had suddenly appeared in the sky. A snap glance revealed that they were chubbier than the other American planes we had fought. They were painted olive green, and only the lower sides of the wings were white. Wildcats, the first Grumman F-4F fighters I had seen. The Wildcats ignored the Zeros, swooping down against the bombers. Our fighters raced ahead, many of them firing from beyond effective range, hoping to distract the enemy planes. The Wildcats plunged into the bomber formation, rolling together, and then disappeared in dives. Over the water just off Savo Island, the bombers released their missiles against a large convoy. I watched the bombs curving in their long drop. Abruptly, geysers of water erupted from the sea, but the enemy shipping sailed on undisturbed. It was obviously stupid to try to hit moving ships from four miles up. I could not understand the failure to use torpedoes, which had proven so effective in the past. Our entire mission had been wasted thrown away in a few seconds of miserable bombing. Inaccuracy. The following day, the bombers returned, this time carrying torpedoes for low-level attacks. But by then, it was too late. Enemy fighters swarmed all over the bombers, and many fell blazing into the ocean even before they could reach their targets. The bomber formation banked to the left and picked up speed for the return to Rabaul. We escorted them as far as Russell, beyond the enemy fighter patrols, and turned back for Guadalcanal. It was about 1.30 p.m. We swept over Lunga, the 18 zeros poised for combat, again bursting out of the blinding sun. Wildcats plunged against our planes. I was the only pilot who spotted the diving attack, and at once I hauled the fighter up in a steep climb, and the other planes followed me. Again the wildcats scattered and dove in different directions. Their evasive tactics were puzzling, for nothing had been gained by either side. Apparently, the Americans were not going to pick any fights today. I turned back to check the positions of my wingmen. They were gone. Things weren't as obvious as they seemed. The enemy would fight, after all. I looked everywhere for Yonakawa and Hattori, but could not find them. Sasai's plane, the two blue stripes across its fuselage, regained formation several other fighters moving up to position behind him, but not my wingmen. Finally, I saw them, about 1,500 feet below me. I gaped. A single wildcat pursued three Zero fighters, firing in short bursts at the frantic Japanese planes. All four planes were in a wild dogfight, flying tight left spirals. The Zeros should have been able to take the lone Grumman without any trouble, but every time a Zero caught the wildcat before its guns, the enemy plane flipped away wildly and came out again on the tail of a zero. I had never seen such flying before. I banked my wings to signal Sasai and dove. The wildcat was clinging grimly to the tail of a zero, its tracers chewing up the wings and tail. In desperation, I snapped out a burst. At once the Grumman snapped away in a roll to the right, clawed around in a tight turn and ended up in a climb straight at my own plane. Never had I seen an enemy plane move so quickly or so gracefully before, and every second his guns were moving closer to the belly of my fighter. I snap-rolled in an effort to throw him off. He would not be shaken. He was using my own favourite tactics, coming up from under. I chopped the throttle back, and the Zero shuddered as its speed fell. It worked. His timing off, the enemy pilot pulled back in a turn. On the fifth spiral, 
the wildcat skidded slightly. I had him, I thought, but the Grumman dropped its nose, gained speed, and the pilot again had his plane in full control. There was a terrific man behind that stick. He made his error, however, in the next moment. Instead of swinging back to go into a sixth spiral, he fed power to his engine, broke away at an angle, and looped. That was the decisive split second. I went right after him, cutting inside the Grumman's arc, and came out on his tail. I had him. He kept flying loops, trying to narrow down the distance of each arc. Every time he went up and around, I cut inside his arc and lessened the distance between our two planes. The Zero could outfly any fighter in the world in this kind of maneuver. When I was only fifty yards away, the Wildcat broke out of his loop and astonished me by flying straight and level. At this distance, I would not need the cannon. I pumped two hundred rounds into the Grumman's cockpit, watching the bullets chewing up the thin metal skin and shattering the glass. I could not believe what I saw. The Wildcat continued flying almost as if nothing had happened. A Zero which had taken that many bullets into its vital cockpit would have been a ball of fire by now. I could not understand it. I slammed the throttle forward and closed into the American plane, just as the enemy fighter lost speed. In a moment, I was ten yards ahead of the Wildcat, trying to slow down. I hunched my shoulders, prepared for the onslaught of his guns. I was trapped. No bullets came. The Wildcat's guns remained silent. The entire situation was unbelievable. I dropped my speed until our planes were flying wing-to-wing -wing formation. I opened my cockpit window and stared out. The Wildcat's cockpit canopy was already back, and I could see the pilot clearly. He was a big man, with a round face. He wore a light khaki uniform. He appeared to be middle-aged, not as young as I had expected. For several seconds we flew along in our bizarre formation, our eyes meeting across the narrow space between the two planes. The Wildcat was a shambles. Bullet holes had cut the fuselage and wings up from one end to the other. The skin of the rudder was gone, and the metal ribs stuck out like a skeleton. Now I could understand his horizontal flight, and also why the pilot had not fired. Blood stained his right shoulder, and I saw the dark patch moving downward over his chest. It was incredible that his plane was still in the air, but this was no way to kill a man, not with him flying helplessly, wounded, his plane a wreck. I raised my left hand and shook my fist at him, shouting, uselessly, I knew, for him to fight instead of just flying along like a clay pigeon. The American looked startled. He raised his right hand weakly and waved. I had never felt so strange before. I had killed many Americans in the air, but this was the first time a man had weakened in such a fashion directly before my eyes, and from wounds I had inflicted upon him. I honestly didn't know whether or not I should try and finish him off. Such thoughts were stupid, of course. Wounded or not, he was an enemy, and he had almost taken three of my own men a few minutes before. However, there was no reason to aim for the pilot again. I wanted the airplane, not the man. I dropped back and came in again on his tail. Somehow the American called upon a reserve of strength, and the wildcat jerked upward into a loop. That was it. His nose started up. I aimed carefully at the engine and barely touched the cannon trigger. A burst of flame and smoke exploded outward from his engine. The wildcat rolled and the pilot bailed out. Far below me, almost directly over the Guadalcanal coast, his parachute snapped open. The pilot did not grasp his shroud lines, but hung limply in his chute. The last I saw of him, he was drifting in toward the beach. The other three Zero fighters quickly reformed on my wings. Yonakawa grinned broadly at me as he slid into position. We climbed and headed back for the island in search of other enemy planes. Anti-aircraft shells began to burst around us. Their aim was sporadic, but the fact that heavy flat guns were already on shore, only hours after the invasion, was upsetting. I knew that our own forces required at least three days, following a beach landing, to set up their anti-aircraft weapons. The speed at which the Americans moved their equipment ashore was astounding. Long after the day's flight was over, Commander Nakajima filled me in on what had happened to the other 14 Zeros. The enemy Navy fighters held a constant advantage over Guadalcanal. They kept diving in groups of six and twelve planes, always from out of the sun, raising havoc with the Zero formations. 
Never before had Nakajima and his men encountered such determined opposition, or faced an enemy who would not yield. Again and again, the plunging wildcats shredded the Zero formation. Every time the wildcats dove, they fired, rolled back, and disappeared far below, refusing to allow the Zeros to use their own advantage, their unexcelled maneuverability. The tactics were wise, but the Americans' gunnery was sadly deficient. Only one Zero fighter fell before these attacks. It was Nishizawa's day to shine. Before his ammunition ran out, the astounding ace in incredible manoeuvres, which left his wingmen hopelessly far behind him, had shot six Grumman fighters out of the sky. For the first time Nakajima encountered what was to become a famous double-team manoeuvre on the part of the enemy. Two wildcats jumped the commander's plane. He had no trouble in getting on the tail of an enemy fighter, but never had a chance to fire before the Grumman's teammate roared at him from the side. Nakajima was raging when he got back to Rabaul. He had been forced to dive and run for safety and Nishizawa and I were the only two pilots in the entire group to down any enemy planes during the day's fighting. Meanwhile, I returned to 7,000 feet with my three fighters behind me. We flew through broken clouds, unable to find any hostile planes. No sooner had we emerged from one cloud than, for the first time in all my years of combat, an enemy plane caught me unawares. I felt a heavy thud, the scream of a bullet and a hole two inches across appeared through the cockpit glass to my left, only inches away from my face. I still had not seen any other planes in the air. It might have been ground fire which hit me. Then, I caught a glimpse of an enemy bomber, not a fighter, which had caught me napping. The Dauntless hung on its wing, racing for cloud cover. The audacity of the enemy pilot was amazing. He had deliberately jumped four Zero fighters in a slow and lightly armed dive bomber. In a moment, I was on his tail. The Dauntless jerked up and down several times, then dove suddenly into a cloud. I wasn't giving up that easily. I went right in after him. For a few seconds, I saw only white as we raced through the billowing mass. Then we were through, in the clear. I closed in rapidly and fired. The rear gunner flung up his hands and collapsed over his gun. I pulled back easily on the stick and the shells walked up to the engine. The SBD rolled repeatedly to the left, then dropped into a wild dive. Yonakawa saw the pilot bail out. It was my 60th kill. Back at 13,000 feet, we searched for, but failed to find the remainder of our group. A few minutes later, over the Guadalcanal coast, I spotted a cluster of planes several miles ahead of our own. I signaled the other fighters and gunned the engine. Soon I made out eight planes in all, flying a formation of two flights. Enemy. Our own planes did not form up into flights in their formations. I was well ahead of the other fighters and kept closing in against the enemy group. I would take the planes on the right and leave the others for the three zeros following. The enemy group tightened formation. Perfect. They appeared to be wildcats and tightening their formation meant that I had not been sighted. If they kept their positions, I would be able to hit them without warning, coming up from their rear and below. Just another few seconds. I'd be able to get at least two on the first firing pass. I closed in as close as possible. The distance in the rangefinder shrank to 200 yards, then 100, 70, 60. I was in a trap. The enemy planes were not fighters, but bombers, the new Avenger torpedo planes types I had never seen before. From the rear, they looked exactly like wildcats, but now their extra size was visible, as were the top turret with its single gun and the belly turret with another 50 caliber gun. No wonder they had tightened their formation. They were waiting for me, and now I was caught with eight guns aiming at me from the right and an equal number from the left. I was on engine overboost, and it was impossible to slow down quickly. There was no turning back now. If I turned or looped, the enemy gunners would have a clear shot at the exposed belly of the Zero. I wouldn't stand a chance of evading their fire. There was only one thing to do, keep going, and open up with everything I had. I jammed down on the firing button. Almost at the same moment every gun in the Avenger formation opened up. The chattering roar of the guns and the cough of the cannon drowned out all other sound. 
The enemy planes were only twenty yards in front of me when flames spurted from two bombers. That was all I saw. A violent explosion smashed at my body. I felt as though knives had been thrust savagely into my ears. The world burst into flaming red, and I went blind. The three pilots following me reported to our commander that they saw both Avengers falling from the sky, along with my plane. They stated further that the enemy planes were trailing fire and smoke. These were officially credited to me as my 61st and 62nd air victories. But an official American report of the battle denied any losses of Grumman TBF Avengers, operating from the three aircraft carriers southwest of Guadalcanal. Perhaps the two planes made it back to their ships. As my own plane dove, with me unconscious in the cockpit, the three Zeros followed me down. They abandoned their chase when my fighter disappeared into a low overcast. Several seconds must have passed before I regained consciousness. A strong, cold wind blowing in through the shattered windshield brought me to. But I was still not in control of my senses. Everything seemed blurred. I kept lapsing back into waves of darkness. These swept over me every time I tried to sit up straight. My head was far back, leaning against the headrest. I struggled to see, but the cockpit wavered and danced before my eyes. The cockpit seemed to be open. Actually, the glass had been shattered, and the wind streamed in to jar me back to semi-consciousness. It struck my face. My goggles were smashed. I felt nothing but a soothing, pleasant drowsiness. I wanted to go to sleep. I tried to realize that I'd been hit, that I was dying, but I felt no fear. If dying was like this, without pain, there was nothing to worry about. I was in a dream world. A stupor clouded my brain. Visions swam before me. With astonishing clarity, I saw my mother's face. She cried, Shame! Shame! Wake up, Saburo! Wake up! You are acting like a sissy! You are no coward! Wake up! Gradually, I became aware of what was happening. The zero plunged earthward like a stone. I forced my eyes open and looked around to see bright, red, flaming scarlet. I thought the plane was burning, but I could smell no smoke. I was still groggy. I blinked several times. What was wrong? Everything was so red. I groped blindly with my hand. The stick. I had it. Still unable to see, I pulled the stick back. Gently. The plane began to recover from its wild plummeting. I felt the pressure push me into the seat as the Zero eased out of the dive and returned to what must have been level flight. The wind pressure abated. No longer did it beat with such force against my face. A wild, panicky thought gripped me. I might be blind. I'd never have a chance to return to Rabul. I acted instinctively. I tried to reach forward with my left hand to grip the throttle, to gain more power. I strained, but my hand refused to move. Nothing. In desperation, I tried to clench my fingers. There was no sensation, just numbness. Then I shifted my feet to the rudder bar. Only my right foot moved, and the zero skidded as the bar went down. My left foot was numb. I gritted my teeth and strained. There was no feeling, no sensation of any kind. My whole left side seemed to be paralyzed. I tried for several minutes to move my left arm or leg. It was impossible. Still, I did not feel any pain. I could not understand it. I had been hit. Badly. But I could feel nothing. I would have welcomed pain in my left arm and leg. Anything. To let me know my limbs were still intact. My cheeks were wet. I was crying. The tears poured out. It helped. Oh, how it helped. The stiffness began to go away. The tears were washing some of the blood out of my eyes. Still, I could not hear anything. But I could see again. Just a little, but the red began to fade. The sunlight streaming into the cockpit enabled me to see the outline of the metal posts. The rangefinder was a blur in front of me. It kept improving, and soon I made out the circles of the instruments. They remained fuzzy. Although I could see them, it was impossible to read the dials. I turned my head and looked out the side of the cockpit. Great black shapes slid past the wings with tremendous speed. They had to be the enemy ships. That meant I was only about 300 feet over the water. Then sound came to me. First I heard the drone of the engine, then sharp, staccato cracks. 
the ships were firing at me. The Zero rocked with the blast waves of the bursting flak. Strangely, I did nothing. I sat in the cockpit without even trying to take any evasive action. The sounds of the bursting shells fell away. I could no longer see the black shapes on the water. I had flown out of range. Several minutes passed. Still, I did nothing but sit in the cockpit, with difficulty trying to think. My thoughts came in fitful snatches. I wanted to go to sleep again. Through my stupor, I realized I could never fly all the way back to Rabaul. Not the way I felt. I would never even make Buka, less than 300 miles away. For a few minutes, the thought of diving at full speed into the sea attracted me as the solution to my disability. I was being stupid. I tried to force myself awake. I cursed at myself. This was no way to die. If I must die, I thought, I should go out like a man. Was I some untried fledgling who didn't know how to fight? My thoughts came and went, but I knew that as long as I could control the plane, as long as I could fly, I would do everything in my power to take one or more of the enemy with me. I was silly, but I felt I would be cheating some enemy pilot if I crashed into the seamily, because I accepted the inevitable so readily. I knew the great value of aerial victories to a fighter pilot. If it had to be, why not in combat? Why go out alone and unseen? A silent splash and an explosion heard by no one. I could no longer even rationalize. Where were the fighters? I cursed and yelled for the wildcats to appear. Come on! I screamed. Here I am! Come on and fight! For several minutes I must have raged like a madman in the cockpit. Slowly I came to my senses. Little by little I realized the ridiculous futility of my actions. I began to appreciate the incredible luck which had kept me alive so far. I had survived many crises before, but none so serious as this. Bullets had ripped by inches away from my head, and more than once had actually grazed my arms, breaking the skin, but causing me no further injury. What was the matter with me? I had a chance to live. Why throw it away? and suddenly I wanted to live. I wanted to reach Rabaul. I moved my fingers down over my face. It was puffy and swollen. I felt tears in the skin, pieces of metal perhaps. I was not certain, but there was blood there too, and I felt several loose patches of skin. The Zero droned on, its engine beat steady. My head continued to clear. More and more, I acted rationally. I sniffed. No odor of gasoline so neither the engine nor the fuel tanks had been hit. That was my most cheering realization since the battle. With the undamaged tanks and a reliable engine, the fighter could have plenty of miles left in it. The wind seemed to increase as my mind cleared. It buffeted at my head. I stared ahead, squinting. The front windshield glass was missing. No wonder it felt so strong. It was beating into the cockpit at more than 200 miles an hour. I felt the blood drying on my face, but the top of my head was still wet, and the wind tugged at the deep crease in my skull, which felt as though it were still bleeding. I must plug something into the wound, I knew, or I would soon black out again, this time from loss of blood. Sudden pain engulfed me, my right eye. It began to throb as the pain steadily increased. I felt it with my fingers and jerked them away. The pain was becoming unbearable. I placed my hand over my right eye again. My vision remained the same. I was blind in the eye. Every Japanese fighter pilot carried with him four pieces of triangular bandage in the pockets of his flight suit. I pulled one out and tried to moisten it with saliva by biting the end. I had absolutely no saliva in my mouth. I was terribly thirsty. My mouth felt dry like cotton. I kept biting and chewing. The end of the bandage slowly became damp. Leaning forward to get away from the steady wind pressure, I wiped my left eye with the moistened bandage. It worked. Little by little my vision cleared, and in less than a minute I could make out clearly the ends of my wings. I sighed with relief, only for seconds. As I sat back I felt a stabbing pain in my head, then another. The pain came and went in waves. For moments I would feel nothing, then a shock as if a blunt-edged hammer had struck me against the skull. I wasted no time in applying the bandage to the head wound, but as soon as I took my hand away the wind snatched the bandage and whipped it away through the shattered glass. 
despair swept over me. How was I to get a bandage around my head? I had to stop the bleeding. My left hand was useless, and I could use only my right in applying the bandage. But my right hand was necessary to hold the stick and to work the throttle. The shrieking wind in the cockpit further complicated the situation. I pulled free a second piece of bandage. No sooner had I laid it in my lap than it was blown away. The third and fourth went as quickly. What could I do? I was almost frantic. The pain in my head had increased. It was now a deep throbbing, each succeeding wave of agony more intense than before. I still had the silk muffler around my neck. I untied the knot and pressed one end beneath my right thigh so that my weight would hold it down in the wind. Then I took out a jackknife, holding it in my teeth while I opened the blade. The muffler fluttered wildly in the wind. I held the knife in my right hand and transferred the end of the muffler to my teeth, then cut out a piece. The wind blew it away. Again I cut the muffler, and again the shrieking wind tore it out of the cockpit. I didn't know what to do. Despair returned. I searched frantically for a solution. There was only one piece of the muffler left. Of course, I should have realised before. I bent forward to escape the wind and began to squeeze the muffler below the edge of my helmet, working it up into the wound. But I had to sit up to continue. The longer I remained leaning forward, the worse the pain became. Finally, I thrust the stick into the crook of my leg and steadied the airplane in this fashion. Then I leaned forward and moved the throttle all the way forward in its slot, holding it in position. When I pulled back with my leg, the zero rose steadily in a long climb. I didn't care how erratically I was flying, so long as I could control the airplane. At one five hundred feet, I eased off on the throttle and returned to level flying. Then I pulled the cushion loose from the seat, so that I would be as low as possible in the cockpit to escape the wind blast. Wedging my leg tightly against the stick to hold the plane steady, I slipped out of the seat to my knees, wedging the cushion with my shoulder to act as a wind buffer. Slowly, I managed to move the muffler further under my cap, pressing it against the wound. I have no idea how long it took me to do this, but it seemed forever. It was impossible to see out of the cockpit, and once the Zero jerked wildly and dropped off on one wing as I hit a violent updraft. If the airplane went out of control I was lost. I couldn't touch the rudder bar at all. Finally I was through. The muffler was taut beneath my helmet and pressed tightly against the wound. I crawled back to my seat and brought the fighter back to an even level. My head felt better at once. The bleeding stopped. My feeling of relief after the strain of working the muffler into position was overpowering. Soon, an overwhelming desire to sleep assailed me. I fought it desperately, but could not shake it off. More than once I fell asleep, my chin resting against my chest. I shook my head, hoping the pain would keep me awake. But every thirty or forty seconds, my shoulders jerked as I slipped against the straps. More than once I snapped awake to find the zero in an inverted position. Once I came to, flying upside down, and was so loggy I failed to move the controls. In a few seconds the engine coughed alarmingly. It was enough to bring me awake, and I jerked the controls over to right the plane. The drowsiness, shaking my head, slower and slower the wonderful, warm, comforting embrace of sleep. Everything was so peaceful. Wake up! Wake up! I screamed to myself. Wake up! I came to with the zero skidding wildly to the right, the wings straight up and down. I had to stay awake. How? How to overcome the frantic urge to go to sleep, not to succumb to it all, to forget everything in the wonderful peace of slumber. It felt so good, so warm, so comfortable. The fighter jerked suddenly. I was upside down again. Stay awake, I shouted to myself. I became angry at my failure to resist the desire to sleep. I lifted my hand from the stick and struck myself on the cheek as hard as I could. Once, twice, three times, hoping the pain would jar me to full consciousness. I could not continue this indefinitely. Soon, I tasted salt in my mouth. Blood spilled out on my lips and trickled down my chin. My cheek puffed up still more and became seriously bloated. 
It felt as though a giant rubber ball were expanding within my mouth. There was no alternative. I must continue to strike myself to stay awake. Perhaps food would help overcome the drowsiness. I took my lunchbox and gulped down several mouthfuls of fish cakes. I was as sleepy as ever. I ate some more, chewed it carefully, then swallowed. In a moment I was violently ill. The plane heeled over out of control as spasms of nausea racked my body. Everything came up, spewing over my legs and the instrument panel. I was nearly insane with the stabbing pains from my head. Even this sudden new agony failed to keep me awake. Again and again I struck my cheek with my fist until I no longer had any sensation there. In desperation, I banged my hand down on top of my head, but to no avail. I wanted to sleep. Oh, to go to sleep. To forget everything. To know that the slumber would never end. Delightful, warm sleep. The Zero reeled and lurched. No matter what I did, I could not keep the wings level. I seemed to hold the stick in one position and never realized when my hand dropped to the left or right, sending the plane over in a wild skidding turn. I was ready to give up. I knew I could not continue on like this. But I swore I would not go out like a coward, merely diving the plane into the ocean for one bright flash of pain, and then nothing. If I must die, at least I could go out as a samurai. My death would take several of the enemy with me, a ship. I needed an enemy ship. Out of an overwhelming despondency, I turned the zero and headed back toward Guadalcanal. Several minutes later my head cleared. No drowsiness, no overwhelming pain. I could not understand it. Why dive to my death now, if I could reach Buka or even Rabal? I turned the fighter again and headed north. In a few minutes the desire to sleep engulfed me once more. I became groggy. Everything seemed to swirl around. What was I doing? Flying north? An enemy ship? I remembered now. I must find an enemy ship and dive. Crash into it at full speed. Kill as many of the enemy's men as I could. The world was misty. Everything dissolved into a haze. I must have turned back to Guadalcanal five times, and as many times reversed my course for Rabaul. I began to shout to myself, over and over again. I was determined to stay awake. I yelled and shrieked, stay awake. Gradually the urge to sleep diminished. I was on the way back to Rabaul, but merely flying north was no guarantee I would ever reach my home base. I had no idea of my position. All I knew was that I was flying in the general direction of Rabaul. I was a considerable distance north of Guadalcanal, but did not know exactly how far away. I searched the sea, but found none of the islands in the chain which stretches up to Rabaul. With only my right foot working the rudder bar, it was probable that I had edged toward the eastern part of the Solomons. I drew the ocean chart from beneath my seat. It was smeared with blood, and it took me several minutes of spitting on the map and rubbing it against my suit to clear some of the blood away. But for the moment it was no help. I tried to orient myself by the sun's position in the sky. Thirty minutes passed and still no islands appeared. What was wrong? Where was I? The sky was absolutely clear, and the ocean stretched without a break to the horizon. Something was lifting me up from my seat. Was I in a downdraft? Everything felt so strange. I was upside down again, and did not realize the plane had rolled around until my body tugged at the seatbelt. Slowly I regained normal position. Something flashed beneath the wings. What could that be? I looked down. It was just a blur. Something dark, stretching endlessly just below the fighter. The water. I was almost in the water. In panic, I leaned forward and shoved at the throttle, the next moment hauling back on the stick. The Zero responded with a rapid climb to 1,500 feet. I throttled back and went on at minimum cruising speed. An island, dead ahead, an island. It was on the horizon, looming out of the water. Elated, I laughed loudly to myself. I would be all right now, I could get my position, and be sure I was heading for Rabaul. I went on and on, anxious for a close look at the coastline. The island failed to appear. Where was it? Was I having hallucinations? What was the matter with me? The island passed to my right, a low-hanging cloud. 
Again, I tried to read the compass. It was still blurred. I spit on my hand and rubbed my left eye. Still, I could not read the dial. I leaned as far forward as possible, my nose almost against the glass. At last, I could see. The reading shocked me. I was holding a 330-degree heading. No wonder I had not seen any islands for nearly two hours. The zero was moving out to the centre of the Pacific Ocean. I took out the chart again and estimated my position as 60 miles northeast of the Solomons. It was only a guess, but the best I could do. I made a 90-degree turn to the left and headed for what I hoped would be New Ireland, which is just northeast of New Britain and Rabaul. Again and again the waves of drowsiness assailed me. I lost count of how many times the plane dropped off on a wing or how many times I frantically brought the zero out of inverted flight. I staggered through the sky, leaning down often to check the compass reading and yanking the stick over until I was back on what I hoped was my heading for New Island. The head pains increased and helped to keep me awake. Then I was suddenly shocked to full consciousness. Without any warning, the engine went dead. There was a strange hissing sound, and then only the shriek of the wind ripping into the cockpit. Instinctively, I shoved the stick forward to gain speed. This way I'd keep from stalling out, and the propeller would continue revolving. I made every move with a deftness which, when I thought about it later, was startling. The mind adapts itself to such emergencies perfectly. I knew, even without thinking about it, that the main fuel tank had been drained. I had one tank left, but only a short time in which to transfer the fuel feed. I must be quick and sure when I change the fuel supply cock. Normally I had no difficulty in manipulating the cock with my left hand. But now it was paralysed. I had to do it with my right hand. I reached across my body. Not far enough. I strained. Still my hand would not reach the other side of the cockpit. The zero dropped slowly toward the ocean, gliding without a tremor. I jerked my arm forward with all my strength and opened the fuselage tank. The fuel would not suck through. The automatic pump leading to the feed lines had been sucking air for too long, and the lines were dried out. I reached for the emergency hand pump and worked it savagely. There was so little time left. The pump worked at once. With a satisfying roar, the engine burst into life, and the zero surged forward. I wasted no time in going back to 1,500 feet. All my months of training for overwater flights now came to my help. I had once established a record in the Navy for flying with a lower fuel consumption than any pilot. If I kept going now at the minimum possible consumption I could get from the airplane, I had perhaps one hour and forty-five minutes left in the air. I adjusted the propeller pitch and throttled back to only 1,700 revolutions per minute. I adjusted the fuel-air mixture to the absolute minimum to keep the engine from stalling. The Zero flew on slowly. I had less than two hours in which to reach a Japanese-occupied island. Less than two hours to live, if I failed. Another hour passed. Nothing met my eyes in the vast ocean and the blue sky. Suddenly I sighted something on the water. An atoll. No mistake this time. No cloud in front of me. It was definitely an island. Its shape became apparent as I drew closer. Green Island the horseshoe-shaped coral reef which I had noticed on the way to Guadalcanal. I checked the island against the map. Hope leaped within me. I was only sixty miles from Rabul. Sixty miles. Normally only a brief hop. But now conditions were anything but normal. My situation could not have been worse. I had enough fuel left for only forty minutes of additional flight. The Zero had been shot up badly, and the drag of the smashed cockpit, as well as the metal skin, which had been chewed up by bullets, seriously affected the airplane's speed. I had been badly wounded and was still partially paralysed. My right eye was totally blind and the left eye none too good. I was exhausted and it took all my effort to keep the plane on an even keel. Another island, dead ahead. This time it was no cloud looming on the horizon. I recognised the mountains. This was New Ireland, no mistake about it. I knew that if I could cross the peaks, which reached to a height of 2,400 feet, I could make rabble. It seemed as if I faced an endless series of obstacles before I could reach my home base. Thick clouds gathered around the peaks, and a violent rain squall lashed the mountains and the island. It seemed impossible to get through. 
exhausted physically and mentally, half blind, and in a badly damaged fighter. How could I get through a squall which was extremely dangerous even under normal conditions? I had no choice but to detour. It was a bitter decision, for the fuel gauge dropped lower and lower. I had only minutes left in the air. I bit my lips and turned to the south. The plane moved slowly down the George Channel between Rabaul and New Island. Two foaming wakes in the water slipped beneath the wings. Soon I saw two warships, heavy cruisers by their looks, steaming south under full speed. They were making more than thirty knots, headed for Guadalcanal. I almost wept at the sight of the Japanese warships. I felt like ditching the plane right then and there. One of the cruisers could swing around and pick me up. My hope was fast running out on me. Rabaul seemed a million miles away. I circled once over the two warships, ready to descend for a water landing. I could not bring myself to do it. The two cruisers were on their way to the fighting off Guadalcanal. If they stopped to pick me up, which was questionable, their firepower would be delayed where it was urgently needed. There could be no ditching. I learned weeks later that the two cruisers were the Aoba and the Kinugasa, each of 9,000 tons. They had been making full steam, headed for Guadalcanal at more than 33 knots. Along with seven other warships, they stormed the Allied convoy at Lunga, sinking four enemy cruisers and damaging another cruiser and two destroyers. I turned again toward Rabaul. The fuel gauge showed barely 20 minutes of flight time remaining. If I failed to reach Rabaul, however, I would be able to crash land on the beach. Then the familiar volcano showed over the horizon. I had done it. Rabaul was in sight. I still had to land. It seemed an impossible undertaking with my left side so completely paralysed. I circled over the airfield, undecided, not knowing what to do. I didn't know that I had been given up for lost, that all the other planes except for one shot down over Guadalcanal had landed almost two hours ago. Lieutenant Sasai told me later he could not believe his eyes when he identified my Zero through his binoculars. He screamed my name, and the pilots came running from all over the field. I couldn't see them from the air through my still damaged left eye. All I saw was the narrow runway. I decided to ditch in the water, just off the beach. The Zero went down slowly. Eight hundred, seven, four, one. Then I was only fifty feet above the water. I changed my mind again. The vision of the airplane crashing into the sea and my wounded head slamming forward was too much. I felt I would never live through the impact. I pulled up again and turned for the runway. If I concentrated, I felt, I could make it. The fuel gauge was nearly at the bottom. I adjusted the propeller to its highest pitch, gunned the engine, and climbed back to 1,500 feet. It was now or never. The zero dropped down when I pushed the stick forward. I lowered the wheels, then the flaps. The airplane's speed dropped sharply. I watched the long lines of fighters parked on each side of the runway rushing up to me. I had to miss hitting the planes. Bring her back. I was too far to the left and yanked back on the stick to go around again. After the fourth circle of the field, I went in for another landing attempt. Once I was in a glide, I lifted my right foot and switched the ignition off with the top of my boot. With even a drop of fuel in the tanks, the Zero would explode if I crashed. The coconut trees on the edge of the field loomed before my eyes. I slipped over them, trying to judge my height by the treetops. Now, I was over the runway. There was a sharp jolt as the Zero struck the ground. I pulled back on the stick and held it against the seat with all my strength to keep the plane from swerving. The Zero rolled to a halt near the command post. I tried to grin, and a wave of blackness swept over me. I felt I was falling, tumbling end over end into a bottomless pit. Everything seemed to be spinning wildly. From a great distance I heard voices calling my name. They shouted, Sakai, Sakai, I cursed to myself. Why didn't they keep quiet? I wanted to sleep. The blackness lifted. I opened my eyes and saw faces all around me. Was I dreaming, or was I really back at Rabul? I didn't know. Everything was so unreal. It was all a dream, I was sure. It couldn't be true. Everything dissolved into waves of blackness and shouting voices. I tried to stand up, 
I gripped the edge of the cockpit and rose to my feet. It was Rabul. It was no dream after all. Then I collapsed, helpless. Strong arms reached in and lifted me from the airplane. I gave in. I didn't care any longer.